when I sat there and I had my son in, on December 14th, 2012. Uh, it is the same day as the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Reporting multiple fatalities uh, involved in the shooting at the elementary school. Reports say the number of dead closer to 30 than to 20, and sadly, most of them are children. And um, I sat there with my wife and my brand new son, amazing little man, um, and we had what we had always wanted. He was our little miracle to have such a, a horrible thing happen on the same day, and then to have a beat of children. 20 children, six educators were all killed that day. I just had this, something inside of me and said, I need to do something, something to help. And I reached out to the jiu-jitsu community. I had a friend who uh, helped me out, designed a patch. I had another friend who helped get the patches made. And from there, I started selling the patches. It kind of spread from Connecticut and then started just taking over and people from around the country wanted to support. With the patches, it just, it was something that was gaining momentum. And we took all the money and we sent it to the Yukon Scholarship Foundation for Victims of Sandy Hook. The media and social media, they, they dive on what's going to make money what's going to get viewership. And when I, unfortunately, months after Newtown in the Sandy Hook Elementary shooting, uh, it, was, it was out of the spotlight. People had stopped talking about it. People had, uh, there, it, something was already uh, taking its place. And that hurt, that hurt me. That bothered me a lot because it's our job to continue to be in our hearts to, to help the people that are outside of the media now that don't have that spotlight anymore because they're still in the same place. The spotlight on them hasn't changed because the, the wake of that event is, has forever changed so many lives in the worst way. The first time I met with Ian Hockley, Dylan's father, he told me about Dylan. He told me how special he was and all the things he would do. And one day, uh, his mom asked him why he was flapping, because sometimes uh, children with autism will flap their hands. And he said, because I'm a beautiful butterfly. So it just kind of fit. So I talked to my instructor and I said, hey, what about a, a huge super seminar? And he said, uh, dream big. I did. And with his support, Rob Magow, uh, we started contacting some black belts, and people I knew from other schools, my school. I started a Facebook page. When something happens with children, people want to help. So and I contacted Pete and he reached out to James Foster in Washington, Robert DeFranco came, some local black belts, and it was an amazing event. A lot of uh, love, love. Uh, some great people. Uh, the Jiu Jitsu community again came together. We donated 100% of the proceeds to Dylan's Wings of Change, which is the foundation they set up in Dylan's name, his parents. It took off, I never expected it to go the way it did. It just, it was, it was perfect. So that's how, uh, that's how Black Belts for Butterflies was, uh, came to fruition. So autism became a focus of Black Belts for Butterflies. So it wasn't just about uh, honoring those that we lost in Newtown all that transpired in helping uh, acceptance for autism because we needed more, uh, more of a voice 
in that community. And then it, it kind of also brought on the power of change and how a person can change their community, how a person can be a positive impact no matter who they are. They don't need to be a famous movie star, famous athlete. They have a, an amazing amount of power inside them, a voice that they can use. The word spread and people really started to get involved. Like, how can I help? And One of the most simple, simple comments uh, Pete Wilhelm said uh, when Robert DeFranco said, what can I do to help? Show up. They first come in the door and they really don't know what's going on. And they know they're coming in for jujitsu. Nine amazing black belts they're going to be teaching. They're going to learn some great techniques. If you're a brown belt, if you're a white belt, it's like, man, you're going to learn some great jujitsu over the weekend. Black belt brings something different to the table. Uh, each black belt brings something different. so gracious of them to share their time and their techniques. Oh, my foot, it doesn't matter, okay? Now, a lot of people try to choke the person here, but this doesn't really, not gonna really choke him, okay? What you have to do when you wanna choke someone is very simple, because this year we have choked him immediately. <coughs> and, um, and they do it because they love it. They love the, you know, what we stand for, the event. You thought he was gonna give like a half a stripe because I missed yeah. just half a stripe. <laughs> just half. Um, I was asked two years ago, this is my third black belt from Butterflies. I was asked two years ago, kind of as an alternate. Um, another black belt had to uh, uh, pull out from the seminar that they were about to host in Connecticut. And um, one of my good friends here, uh, James Foster, another black belt, he messaged me and said, hey, they're looking for another guy. Do you want in? I was like, absolutely. And I responded right away and they called me and uh, we set it up from there. If I, ideally, if I can catch the, like his bottom and hook my head all the way over, perfect. Why? Because I'm going to take him over this one. I'm not going to let go of this grip. Okay? Keep in mind, this, this whole series, you guys, is everything based on this last one. So Jake goes to try the same side of the path, but this time, you're right now. I had already heard about what the cause was because my friends were involved, um, but it, it, it pulled me in even more so when I heard a little bit more of the backstory from Rich McKeegan. And also on another level in regards to um, uh, acceptance of autism and autism awareness, that whole movement and that whole uh, uh, push for people more uh, of a better understanding of others, um, uh, it just meant a lot. My son uh, grew up and he still has some, uh, some learning disabilities of his own. And uh, it's been hard work through the years, so I can understand for uh, parents and people um, that have, uh, have to deal with uh, those that uh, have autism and that are on the spectrum. Uh, what do I think I bring to Black Belts for Butterflies? Well, I try to be a unicorn and bring unicorn magic. 
Um, but really, I try to bring a different perspective. A lot of women who teach jiu-jitsu, a lot of the high-level black belts are 120 pounds or less, and I am not that. Um, I think I bring a different approach to jiu-jitsu from being a big woman. There's a lot of big men out there teaching, but not a whole lot of big women teaching. Um, and I try to teach like embracing your assets and your attributes and not being ashamed of being big or strong. So this is a Hillary Smash style pass. Why do I think that people should get involved with jiu-jitsu organizations like Black Belts for Butterflies? Um, first of all, I've found the people that are involved with these organizations, the people that come around are just really good people and it's it's amazing to see the energy like that filled these mats this weekend from all across the country. We're just really amazing people, people who are teaching and people who aren't even teaching. They're just amazing people. So I think just the people that come together is pretty awesome. Try to take the back. And reach through, <laughs> distract them a little bit, and then look. I start to still sit and put my hook through here, and I adjust this by pulling it through. And I want to crunch down and try to put my elbow to my belly button. Yeah. And it should be just a really nice choke. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go. One, two, three. Just do it slow, but you gotta, don't fucking kill each other. You know what it is, like, I was super hyperactive, I was probably OCD, I was probably a lot of that stuff. My dad was like, look, there's something fucking wrong with this fucking half week kid. And so I'm gonna have to put him into sports. And so, I played every sport under the sun. It didn't matter what season it was, I was in the sport. If it was swimming, it was swimming, it was whatever. Running, badminton. <laughs> so, needless to say, if there was an activity, I was in it because what was it? you would occupy my extra energy and brain cells that were like totally firing for no reason. And I think that's what Jiu Jitsu does for, for uh, autistic and or special needs kids. With all seriousness, besides all the crap that I talk. I think it's cool that everybody's from other teams because it shows that we're unified behind a, a, a one goal and I don't think that the thing about who, what team, everybody's from doesn't even enter into my head at this point. At that time I, I'm like, I don't give a fuck what team these guys are on, I know that we're doing this for a good deed and it's all about the good deed, right? So, you know, so it definitely, for me it's cool because I get to meet a bunch of cool people. I mean, the, the seminars are, are fucking awesome and I'll fucking do a thousand of them a year if I could. I can only see it being accepted as really something really cool. something different outside of the event as well that people don't see uh, you know there there's so much that goes beyond just the event so it's the text messages it's the Facebook messages it's the phone calls it's the emails it's the personal touch it's the talking to them at dinner it's there's so many things that go that go on before an event and after an event. So, you know, and each one has separately, you know, really affected me personally. So it's like, how do you, how do you sit there and say something so small and simple about someone that's affected you greatly? That's, that's, that would be tough.
hand on his shoulder or head and I post my hand on the ground and I fold him. All right? When I fold him now, I'm gonna shoot this leg right under his head. All right, so, but pay attention to my hand. I'm really, sorry. I'm really cupping my hand behind his neck. But see how I went here? Now, to take his back and for this crank, I don't know the name. The other guys might have a name for that, I don't know. Look, I'm squeezing him here. This is like maybe not so easy. Cut my hand on his biceps and really bring it back. Now, I'm gonna fall to this side. And that's when usually I get a hook. Like, I like things that are part of a larger community. Like there's a bigger picture behind this here. So like I was happy to come over and participate at that. And then when I found about the actual cause, um, you know, what Rich is trying to do. And I've actually taught children with special needs jiu-jitsu, um, which is um, a difficult skill, but uh, ultimately a rewarding one. So on, on that sense, like directly you can, uh, can uh, help and impact somebody's life with jiu-jitsu. Um, and also as us as a community, uh, the idea that we can band together, work together towards a common goal, in this case, you know, raising funds which are needed for working with kids with special needs um, is important too. So there's a lot of different ways that the jiu-jitsu community and jiu-jitsu in particular can help with kids with special needs. Um, the level of patience that requ is required um, goes up exponentially. You need a lot of patience to teach children. Um, and there's different ways of reaching it and getting that out there. Uh, and there's certain tools that I guess to somewhat instinctively that you would know working with, uh, with children, um, whether you have children of your own or if you were a child yourself. With working with children with special needs, um, you have special considerations come out, like their uh, background, their thought processes, um, the way that they learn uh, is not the norm. So you have to learn how to adapt to that or, or what is how to reach them, knowing that you have those constraints to work with right there. Um, so it, it's, it's a challenge, but it can definitely be overcome. Um, I've been at this for a long time, uh, involved in the community for a long time. Um, so I, I do have a certain level of expertise when it comes to teaching, I hope. Um, I, I like that process. Um, you know, like I try to kind of convey some concepts about working with other folks uh, within our community, how to be a, a good training partner. Um, and once you develop, like, you know, let alone with, like, special needs or something like that, which is a, a, a skill set of its own, like, maybe a more specialized skill set, it's like, you know, you should be able to work at least with any able-bodied person or any right-minded person right there that's going through jiu-jitsu. And the more that you learn to take the lead and be able to, um, if not, like, as equals work with somebody, I, I made a comment earlier during my portion that the darker your belt is, uh, the more responsibilities that you have. Um, in terms of leadership and what you can show and how you can affect somebody's life. Um, hopefully, um, those skills as you develop that, um, you can translate into working with folks that are, you know, all the way to special needs or somebody that has like certain issues or problems. And it's not always somebody that has quote unquote like the, the, the definition of a special needs person. but. Um, the more you work this, the more you learn how to hopefully work with and, and touch more and more people, like increase that audience. I'm in a position to do something. I have a black belt and I won these titles, but they don't mean anything. They mean something to me and it serves to make me feel good about myself, like, oh, look at what I have accomplished. But at the end of the day, that's not going to make a difference in anybody else's life, except for mine. So, being able to be part of an event like this, this is how I get to posit positively impact somebody else's life. It's not about the titles, it's not about the gold medals. The world has plenty of those, plenty of champions, plenty of, plenty of people to, to win tournaments and, and win championships. But the world could use more people willing to step up and say, let me fight for you and, and let me be your voice and let me be an instrument or a tool to help you. And people will remember that forever.
My legacy isn't going to be being a world, world champion. But that's not going to be my legacy. My legacy is going to be how did I make a difference in someone else's life? How did I make that person feel? It's important to remember that we are in a position because people look up to us and they think, oh wow, they've accomplished all these things, but I don't want people to remember me that like, oh, she, she came in and, and she was just this champion from whatever tournament, it doesn't matter. But she showed up and she cared and she was kind and she wanted to hear my story and she's helping me get my story out, out into the world. And for that reason alone, whatever is important to somebody else can be important to me too because it's gonna make a difference and it's gonna echo and ripple and maybe that person will make an impact in somebody else's life and that person and that person and that's when change can really happen. I have a little bit of reach in the jiu-jitsu community. I have a little bit of a character. Uh, my nickname's 300s because of the beard and the look. Not because of my weight. I'm only 275, you know, but everybody thinks, uh, you know, I look like Leonidas from 300. That's how I got the nickname. It became a little bit of a branding little character and uh, it's given me a, a minor celebrity in the jiu-jitsu community. So I've uh, become involved with a lot of causes and uh, use that to reach out and help others, uh, you know, whenever and however I can. This is my fourth year involved with Black Belts for Butterflies. And it's, a, it's an honor to be involved and it's an honor to see it continue to grow and to reach more people all over the world. Yes, I've had several children with autism that have trained at my academy over the years and uh, they really respond well to being pushed. Um, they overcome all the odds. Uh, I don't treat them any differently than the other kids, so I hold them to a very high standard. And I've found that works best, uh, you know, not uh, holding anything back and really making them work hard. And they always, they always surprise me. They over, always overcome any obstacle that's in their way and just thrive in that type of environment. It's a beautiful story. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, example of somebody uh, being touched by something and taking it upon themselves to try to play some role in, in uh, raising awareness and helping in whatever way they could. It started something as simple as him making a, a little patch and look where we're at today. shoulders lean real heavy on the back of the neck. I am a Nazi about being on the balls of my feet. I like to be on the balls of my feet as much as possible. You'll see me also switching my weight very frequently. I'll clasp and then I go to my second grip. My second grip is meant to be able to get me past his, his elbow here. So I'm here and here, okay? Now, the next, uh, the next position here we're gonna go to is position number two in the four point drill and I'm gonna try to get my left knee right behind his ankle here. Okay. As quickly as possible. What matters. what matters is that when we get to these positions of influence, is that uh, we we you know we help utilize that to get to as many people uh, this information as possible. You know, there may be people out there that that may be experiencing with their family members, with kids or otherwise uh, symptoms of autism that might not have seen this otherwise. You know, uh, some people that 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 uh, might be in denial about it. You know. And this goes with uh, the submit the stigma type of, of, of idea as well, you know, mental health and, and things like that. If we can bring awareness to this, maybe we can help curb some of the negative effects of the, of the experiences they're actually feeling, these, these individuals are going through currently. Maybe if we can bring awareness to them and say, hey, look, you know what, we're here for that cause. We're fighting for it. And, you know, it's okay. It's okay to feel bad about it. You know, we're here for you. Let us help support that and uh, let, let us help drive that rhetoric to the community so we can all build together. Does that make sense? About when I was talking earlier about some people, that, uh, autistic people, they can't walk very well, they can't speak very well. 
I know when you guys see Kurt hobbling around here, <laughs> you might have thought I was talking about this. <laughs> the first thing to do is to make your opponent sit up. Pin his legs to the ground. Boom. As soon as he sits up, lift. Pass. Okay. The main goal now for Black Belts and Butterflies is to raise awareness to autistic children. Our perspective on what autism was, what autistic people deal with, what their families do. Autism classified as a neurodevelopmental disorder, characterized by uh, uh, impaired social interaction, uh, verbal and nonverbal communications with repetitive behavior. There's no blood test for autism. There's no scan, there's no x-ray, there's no urine test. It's classified by a group of behaviors. I have an autistic child, my son. You know, uh, one thing was evident, when the day he could walk, he was hyper. He was hyperactive. As soon as he was walking, he was running. We dropped him off at kindergarten. Have a good day. And they called us the first day. You have to come have a meeting. And we went to him, and they basically told us that he had to be in a special ed program. Couldn't be in the regular class. That was hard to hear. So, and, it, and anyone who has hyperactive children, they're difficult children, they're not easy. It's hard to take them outside, it's hard to take them to the public, it's hard to take them on an airplane or in a restaurant or in a grocery store. It's just not easy. There's, autism is a wide range of disabilities. Uh, there's mildly high functioning autistic people, and then there's low functioning, very severely autistic people. If you met a severely autistic person, you probably knew it. The, uh, their disabilities are very uh, evident. They're, some of them are unable to speak. Some of them have uh, trouble with their fine motor skills. Uh, if you met a mildly autistic person, you might not have known. Uh, mildly autistic people sometimes just come off as a little strange, a little weird, or a little odd. You know, as a parent, you feel like it's your job to take care of your child. And your child is suffering. He's struggling. You're trying to help him. You don't know how. And we tried everything we, we did. We spent money we didn't have. We're just trying to find a way to help him. Journey. And our goal was we were going to find a way to help him. The therapies that are available for your kids are hard to come by, at least in this state. And, uh, you know, dealing with their schools and the, you know teachers that don't stick around very long, or they don't, you know, they're not. You can tell that our kids need people that are 100% committed, and there's not a lot of teachers that are 100% committed to the kids. Uh, the medical profession is kind of the same. Once your child receives a diagnosis, they're not very helpful. They don't. Want, they just want to keep, you know, keep you on the on the normal medical path that that neuro, neurotypical children are, and for a lot of us parents, that's just unacceptable. You can't you can't treat the kid that different, the same way that you treat the kids that that are typical. I, I just I would like there to be a rethinking of the process. Um, I don't believe that children that are at birth need to be given chemicals right away. I don't think that some of the medicines are, should be preserved the way they're preserved. <clears throat> I think um, the thinking of, well, we've medicated these problems to extinction. So let's stay on this path. Well, if we've medicated these problems to extinction, why can't we rethink that process now? Now that there's, there's not an epidemic of whatever it is, let's just give these kids a chance to, to for their brains to develop, for their bodies to develop, for all their systems in their bodies to develop. And, and the answer, it's infuriating at times, is it's always no. It's a resounding no. We're not going to do anything to alter what we do. It's just, you know, essentially it's it, the, what they're saying is tough shit. You know, that's unacceptable. I would honestly... You know, I, I'm at my kids' school every day, and I, I would have to say the school districts here in California, I, not all of them, the ones that I deal with and the ones that are around my kids, that's the most difficult, frustrating 
thing we deal with is, you know, information. You know, I, I believe that they're very afraid of litigation. So they're very afraid to share any information. They're very afraid to say the wrong word because, well, you're going to sue us. Well, you know, parents might not be as pissed off as they are if they were kept in the loop a little bit. You know, this is their kid. It's very personal. It's very personal to them. And I understand that this is their job, but this is our child. And, and a lot of times we just need to be kept in the loop. I, I think that might be where the problem lies because I, I, I believe that at least the parents that are active, like me and my wife, uh, I believe we're saying the things we expect someone to have a natural human being reaction to. And it just is, isn't... Not that I expect to get my way all the time, but it's very rare, at least in my situation and the situations that I speak to other parents about, it's very rare that we get our ways without litigation. You know, so we have this cycle of them being afraid of litigation. Us not, we don't really want to do that, but they won't tell us anything because they're afraid, and then even when they do say something to us, they're still worried about what they're saying. And it's just, if I could say anything to them, it's, man, if it's a job to you, then it's the wrong job for you. If you're not here to help, then what are you here for? Because we need people that are, that are actively trying to make these kids' lives better, to make the parents' lives a little bit better. You know, and, and to be honest, you know, my life gets better when my kids' education program gets better. If you can just put a face with the word autism, if you can make it personal for people, that maybe it's the community that is where it's most beneficial for the autism community and uh, to get involved in jiu-jitsu and have people have a personal experience with autism. Maybe they, they don't have a kid on the spectrum. Maybe they just know somebody that knows somebody. And instead of having awareness, we have a little more acceptance, a little more open-eyed experience instead of, I know somebody down the corner. What? It's, that's still some Jericho juice from... Uh... <laughs> uh, but anyway, look... Uh... I had a half time uh, coming here because, you know, there was kind enough, Hitch was kind enough to, to bring me here and then put me to a head hoof in. And uh, <laughs> uh, they left the light on for me, but uh, they also left to me the, this fucking guy here. They, they la left a, a, a husky a Mexican gentleman to sleep in the fucking bed next to me, and this guy was snore all night. Uh, I, didn't, I got about an hour and a half sleep, okay? So that's why I was not back trying to catch some Z's over here. So I can have a lot of, I can have some energy for later on. I'm gonna watch the fights, have some alcohol, whatever. Um, and uh, also, I'm gonna provide some for some of the, how many single mom you have here? We're gonna hang out later. I'm gonna give up uh, free privates. My privates is gonna be free tonight. And we're gonna, we're gonna hang out. Okay, so anyway, but I'll, I'll joke aside, okay? Okay, yeah, I, you know, I don't do a lot of uh, uh, charity stuff unless it's for my own charity, which is called Hanachi's Kids, okay? <laughs> and all the proceeds is go to back child support <laughs> because I can't afford that one and somebody gotta get paid over here, so we usually do that. How many of you guys, it's the first time uh, you seen uh, your Uncle Hanachi on the flash? Some of you may be seen before, but you know, um, you know, don't take for granted um, being able to saw me for the first time. <laughs> okay, because that's an experience that um, I'm never gonna have ever again. Because I remember the first time I saw myself, <laughs> and it was sobering, and it was. Um, it was game, uh, but but and then you know and you have to imagine this, okay? You gotta imagine for you guys. You you see me here. You see me at the flash, yeah? Okay, Baba Boo. 
<laughs> but never mind Babalu for now. <laughs> you guys are seeing me in the flesh, okay? Myself, I'm never gonna see me like that. I'm only seeing only but a reflection. <laughs> Think about that for a second. <laughs> Think about that. Never in my life I'm gonna see why you guys get a chance. If only I had that one the opportunity when I was growing up to have that. People like me and Lu Luigi. Where's the Luigi? Huh? Oh, there you are. <laughs> it's right over here. Uh, but you know, we didn't have that opportunities when we was, you know, here and all that stuff. So you know, you guys said this that time is now. Okay, you're gonna enjoy and this. Has I haven't yet been able to sit there and walk up and introduce myself and not feel absolute joy of seeing all the participants on the mats. It's, it's overwhelming for me. And look around while all of our guest speakers talked about uh, their challenges uh, with autism or their challenges as parents or uh, having siblings with autism as well as our guest speakers that came in and talked about other uh, benefits uh, that other people can get involved in. But as the event unfolds, watching them change and from when they come in to when they leave, watch people evolve. Even the black belts that maybe haven't been you know, at an event before and this is their first event teaching, he's saying that what they came into the event and how they left, they've changed. No last words, because we're gonna continue. Uh, we're gonna keep growing. Uh, there's gonna be new black belts, the awesome black belts that have been a part of this. Uh, there's gonna be more participants, and more attendees, and they turn from participants to attendees to friends. And almost family. Once you show up, you wear a patch, uh, you wear a t-shirt, you hashtag, you wear a hat. Uh, you're part of this event. You're part of Black Belts for Butterflies and no one can ever take that away. So you show up, you're part, thank you. And we just keep getting bigger and stronger and more impact and helping more people.